Greetings, viewers. Uh, thanks for all the fresh new subscriptions. It has recently come to my attention because of the viewers and uh, the demographics I'm getting on my analyticals there that um, a lot of people are actually using this channel to kind of scope out what's life like in Hawaii. Um, I, I didn't really intend for that initially. My thoughts, and they're not always correct, originally were that, well, I'd, you know, help people with garden issues and how to grow their fruit trees and so on, as I've always done. Um, but, and that's happening, you know. And then again, there's a bunch of you just kind of watch it for the amusement. <laughs> All right, that's fine too, but it, it, it is actually looking like I have somewhat become a default ambassador to Puna District here on the Big Island because having been a man who did come from the mainland and come here and successfully established myself uh, you know in the community to one extent or another and then of course I've been broadcasting it out across the internet uh, I, I get a lot of people that are really looking at me and going okay what's Bill doing and can we do that uh, apparently there's you know quite a bit of interest um, in people actually moving here to this place um, it doesn't really surprise me much that people would want to come here. I mean, you get, I don't know how many million tourists every year that come from all over the planet to see the place. It's worth visiting. You know, if you've never been here, absolutely. I'd say, come on, you know. Um, but living here, you know, that's another story, actually. I guess there's always been people all along time who felt they wanted to be here, otherwise the island would be empty, right? So there's all kinds of reasons. There's probably as many reasons why people would want to come to this place as there are people who come here. Not everybody who comes succeeds. I, I think there could be a lot of, uh, well, you know, we refer to Hawaii as paradise. Well, paradise is a state of mind, and that's it. It's not a state of the union. Um, Hawaii is one of the most wonderful places I have ever been in the United States, and so I am not dissing it, you know. I love this place. I fell in love with it when I came here. Um, but we do oftentimes come here with a lot of illusions, you know, about what this really means. And uh, maybe, maybe I was lucky, maybe I succeeded in what I'm doing because I really didn't have any preconceived notions much and nor did I actually want to or plan to come here uh, so that makes me a little different I guess um, I ended up here because of uh, well you could call it synchronicity or you want to call it fate or whatever you want to call it uh, but I, I got here more from things that pushed me rather than me trying to reach out and grasp it. So I really didn't reach out and grasp this place. It kind of reached out and grabbed me, is more how it happened. And, uh, well, I can't complain. But, you know, I didn't come here expecting it to be paradise or expecting everything to be wonderful and so on. I was pleasantly surprised when I first arrived here, uh, first trip, you know, to find that um, people have time we don't have as much time sickness in Hawaii as we do in the mainland. People will take the time to stop and talk to each other, to smile. They will wave while working out front lately with the pig fences. I have seen so many people come by and just wave. I mean, they probably know who I am as they flow by every day going back and forth to work. You know, I'm just another one of the neighbors. I may or may not know who they are, but they will just wave. Um, the other day coming back from the post office there was a, a a couple that had tried to turn the car around on the highway and had pulled too far off the shoulder they had both front wheels sunk in the mud new mud here they had hit some of that good soil we got and it was raining they went down and so they couldn't get the car back on the road so i stopped and i tried pushing with the guy's girlfriend and eh, we didn't quite have enough to get him out of there Another lady stopped. She kind of pushed, but that didn't make it either. Well, before we could even scratch our heads, 
or called AAA, we must have had another four trucks full of nice beefy local guys pull over and just get in there. And I mean, we could have lifted the car back on the highway, literally, and thrown it. We had so many people. And, hey, it was nobody asking for help, you know. Nobody had a sign up. People just saw there was an issue, and so they stopped to help with it. Um, and they definitely have time to stop and talk, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in an age of... Uh, of uh, instant communications, texting, cell phones, and you know, and all this junk, uh, where people are staring at screens rather than looking at each other most of the time. People here still have the time to sit around and do what is called talk story. I talk, they listen, other people talk. You know, um, it, it's it's like it always kind of used to be before the digital age came on us. Um, there are a lot of things here in Hawaii that are sort of backward. They're old fashioned. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not good. In fact, the, fa the, the on Sundays, a lot of the private business in Hilo will close. Oh my gosh, I remember living in Chicago in the 1950s. In the 1950s, on the way back from church on Sunday, oh man, I mean the hardware store would open for one or two hours on the way back from church so you could get some nails if you had a Sunday project on your day off. The bakery would open for an hour or so so that you could get a loaf of bread so you have for your Sunday dinner. Well, that was it. Everything else was shut, you know? And there is still, you know, the Walmarts and the Home Depots and everything here in Hawaii, they're open you know, 24-7, but most of the smaller bakeries and stores and independent businesses and so on, they're, they're shut on Sundays, and people actually, you know, go out to the beach, they have a barbecue with the family and so on. I remember this as life in the 50s and maybe the early 60s in the Midwest. This is the type of thing we did, too, you know, and it was wonderful. I loved it and when I first came to Hawaii and I realized that people still do that here. They still have time for a family barbecue, maybe once a week even. My goodness, you know. I said, well, now that is something that we've lost on most of the mainland, but it isn't lost here. And I think that's a good thing. It attracted me and I immediately, you know, said, man, I love the culture. Um, reminds me of when I was a boy. Uh, and there are a lot of things about it that are very much that way. But then there's the aloha culture. Uh, and it's real. I mean, not everybody you meet every time, everywhere is going to offer you aloha. Some of them are going to stick a gun in your face and take your wallet like they will anywhere else in the United States. But in general... Uh, I find that people here tend to be uh, quite friendly. Um, they stop and just talk or laugh, and, uh, and uh, they're not tired of people here, which is amazing for the amount of tourists that we haven't, <laughs> as of yet, grown tired of people as a culture here in Hawaii. But it's true, people are not tired of people. Alaska is similar in that regard. It's so sparsely populated that that people still have time for you. They don't hate people. Grew up in Chicago, you learn to hate people. I've had to learn to undo hating people while I live here in Hawaii. You know, maybe I was lucky that I had a transitional step through Wisconsin where people would wave as you passed down the road, or the San Francisco Bay Area where we have a tendency to be extremely tolerant of almost all forms of life and, you know, and creeds, races, and so on. It's such a cosmopolitan place with so many different ideas. We haven't got time to point fingers at the enemy, you know. You know the enemy are the people who point fingers. <laughs> They're the ones. Um, so, yeah, I, I was prepped, I guess, and I'm slowly and gradually adjusting to the idea, for instance, of Ohana. I, I, apparently Ohana is not exactly a Hawaiian word. It's a Japanese term. But it's definitely part of this culture, and it has to do with the idea that, you know, everybody around you is pretty much family. Uh, it, it works. I mean, uh, Hawaiians venerate uh, the, uh, the kapunas, the, the older people. They have the wisdom. They know the songs, you know, and so forth. 
Um, and uh, there is still respect for age and experience here. But we also kind of just tend to sort of reach out and tend to include other people uh, as we're thinking about things. You know, this whole idea of, uh, um, yeah, well, I'd, I'd get into politics and I, I don't want to go there. But Hawaii has a tendency to be politically very left compared to most of the mainland United States. And it's not that people out here are socialists or anything on that order, you know, it's not it. It's just that it has always been traditional here in this island community that people take care of each other. <laughs> and nobody else to take care of them when you're sitting 2,500 miles away from every other place on earth on a rock in the middle of the ocean, you know, you kind of got to take care of each other, you don't survive. And uh, that that's the Ohana culture here. And it flows right through the politics. It's real, you know. And so we do have uh, um, a lot of services that uh, are taken for granted here as being normal that in the mainland would be awful left. They'd be awful far left. I can say it's got nothing to do with the political viewpoint as much as it has to do with the social one. Um, I like that. To me, that's good. You take care of the people around you. That's <laughs> you take care of your family. You take care of your friends. You take care of the guy who got the car stuck on the road in the mud. I mean, that's it. Almost everywhere that I have ever lived, where it was wonderful country, great place to live. Sooner or later, everybody else figured it out too. And so there they were. Whereas, you know, I had all the room in the world and things were great one day and the next day all the fields were paved, you know, the farms were gone, they were shopping centers and housing developments and stuff like this. And I have watched the wholesale and wanton destruction of our nation due to population growth and paving everything and the urbanization, you know. There's still a lot of open space out there in the middle of Kansas, but the truth of the matter is no one really wants to be there, that's why it's open space. Places like the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, I, I saw it for the first time in the mid-1950s. I loved it in those days. It was great. I loved it. Of course, I came from Chicago. San Francisco, <laughs> totally bad. Totally. Uh, you know, and uh, later I lived there during the late 1960s. In those days, it was great. Of course, it was very exciting. That was a cultural revolution. All new music, new lifestyles, you know. Free love. Eh? It was a cool place at the time. Um, it's still a good place, but so many people have wanted to come there. Nowadays, about all I can really say for it is the climate is still pretty darn good. I think the culture is still pretty good in the Bay Area, you know, and and uh, and the money's great. Great place to make money. There's so much money there. It's easy, easy to be successful in the Bay Area. You know, it doesn't take a lot of brain power to make a lot of money living there. So, you know, of course things cost. They say it's one of the more expensive places in the country. And I'm just going to say the same thing about Hawaii. And these, these are probably really true, you know, but I have frequently lived in places that other people consider to be too expensive to live. Well, I'll tell you what, the reason they're expensive is they're really cool. <laughs> Very seldom. Do you ever find a really cool spot on earth that's really got everything going for it and it's cheap? If you do, you're the first guy there and then the next ones who come and get more and more and more expensive. Somebody had to get it cheap, you know. That's, it does work that way, but generally speaking, by the time most of us become aware uh, that a place is hot, um, the price is driven up through the roof. So far it hasn't really happened too much to Puna. The prices go up here. They haven't gone up crazy. Um, it's a value, as far as I'm concerned. That's it was how I got here. I was encouraged by friends when I was actually planning to uh, retire in the central coast of California. And at the time uh, I finally made the move and had the money and was going to do it, we had just hit the California real estate boom. The central coast had gone 300 percent overnight, and uh, I ended up looking here and have a lot of illusions about it. Family had been over here 
for years and years and years because stepfather worked for United Airlines and mom and dad would either fly to Las Vegas and gamble or fly to Hawaii and hang out. And that's kind of the way life was, but they'd bring me back a bag of Mac nuts. But here we are. And I, I, the price of property in Pune tends to attract people. Uh, and I don't blame you, but cheap is cheap. <laughs> that's the way it is, you know. Uh, I had a, when I finally decided on the fact that I was probably going to shop land here, and I had made a list of parameters, okay, there were certain things that the property had to have. Um, I think that's a real good idea for anybody who's going to come here and shop for real estate or thinking about moving. Create yourself a list of what it is that you think you need to be comfortable in life, okay, because not every place around here is going to have what you want. Uh, things are rather primitive on a lot of this island and uh, so if you have certain things I highly recommend that you put them on the list. I finally did locate a piece of property that matched almost all the parameters on my list. The only thing that didn't fit was the price. This property cost me twice what I had actually planned to spend and I could have bought a piece of property here at that time for what I had intended to spend. But then I was going to have to strike other things off of my parameter list to get that. And I didn't want to. Uh, what I paid for the property at this point in time is irrelevant. And so I got what I wanted. And I got what I wanted because I ignored the cost and I stayed away from cheap as a parameter. See, now, Puna is, the draw is cheap. There's a lot of really cheap land here, but cheap land is generally poor land. It depends, you know, what I want and what you want, they're not necessarily the same thing. What I put up with when I was 20 years old, for instance, and homesteading in Wisconsin, and building my own cabins and so on, you know, uh, well, what I tolerated then at 20, 25 years old, I ain't going to tolerate now that I'm over 65, you know. So, I needed certain things. This property had them. It had everything except price. And so a lot of the cheaper land that's around here, um, well, it can be on roads that are absolutely disgusting. They're private and they're not going to get any better at any time soon. And there can be miles and miles and miles of them wandering way back into the forests. Uh, so that if you just want to go to the grocery store, you're going to have to spend 15 miles over bumpy lava and mud roads just to get the heck out to the highway, you know, uh, if that appeals to you, which it does for some people. You know, some of the reason the roads are the way they are here is because there are people who will fight tooth and nail to make sure that they are not improved. Uh, you know, they go to the battle with the homeowners association about fixing the roads in some of these subdivisions here because the people enjoy their isolation. And so if that's what you want, you know, then you can get it here, and that is what you'd be shopping for. It's a parameter. You want a junky road that nothing short of a Humvee can make it down, you know, and any time flat. My car won't penetrate some of the roads in these subdivisions without it taking on damage. <laughs> that's how bad some of them are, and I refuse to go into those places. Also, when you're back in those places, those are usually the spots that attract the worst characters. And a lot of the island is actually very much Wild West and Wooly. We got a whole lot of characters here, all right? And there's a lot of places here that the cops don't even go into, all right? <laughs> or if they go, they go with backup. I know I have a subdivision down the road here come by my place to get into it and it's got such a reputation for itself that the police always go on patrol with two squads. They always have backup, they don't go in there. And that's the nature of a lot of the real far outback here. You've got a lot of Rastafarian reefer growers that got trip wires and AK-47s and stuff watching over the crop, you know. Uh, there's a meth problem here, and the worst neighborhoods generally contain the, the ice addicts. Um, 
there are some whole subdivisions that I just wouldn't enter. And they're going to be cheap. And so watch out for cheap here. It's you, not, got, you got Ohana and Aloha as well as you got Scumbag. <laughs> or locally, that's the Chicago term. Uh, locally, it's the cockroaches, you know. You get plenty of them here. I know a lot of folks who grew up in the in the mainland United States, and especially you know in the central portion where agriculture uh, is uh, easy. You have deep soils from the prairies. You have rainfall. The corn, the soybeans grow, and so on. Planting a garden full of pumpkins and tomatoes and beans and stuff and watermelons is easy. You know, often it is. Uh, I lived in the Midwest a good part of my life and uh, as far as I'm concerned for growing Illinois is a garden of Eden. Okay, the deep black rich prairie soils, quite fertile, great rainfall, good climate during the growing season, you know, corn grows easy, soybeans grow easy, pumpkins grow, all sorts of things that we all know. Wheat grows in Illinois, you know. Wisconsin was similar, it's a little cooler, you get north and Cabbages grow better than tomatoes, I guess, but it's still potato country to the max. Um, all those crops that we know from temperate latitudes uh, grow really well in parts of the mainland United States. California's a, a fruit basket, you know, Kansas, a bread basket, and so on. But in general, crops in temperate latitudes are one set of plants. Crops in tropical latitudes are another set of plants. And so say you come here from Minnesota and you're used to eating the typical stuff that we eat and grow in Minnesota and you want to live in Hawaii and you try planting the same crops here, it's a good possibility I'm going to do so well. <laughs> I mean I found that moving here is a definite change of diet. Now I used to change a diet because I have moved in many different places over the years and I'm just used to that changing as I go from one place to another. You know, California is so much uh, Mediterranean, uh, Hispanic, and uh, Asian food. There's, there's all three actually there and, and the fusion between, you know, it's actually kind of hard to find a, a hamburger steak with gravy, uh, uh, canned corn on the side with mashed potatoes. That is not easy, you know. <laughs> But if you're in Iowa, it's a piece of cake. Um, you know, a meatloaf plate. You know, I can get one here. There is one, okay? And in fact, I can find it in, in Hilo. I know where to find one, but it's only on the chalkboard, you know. It comes and goes. So, yeah, the kind of food and things you're used to eating if you come from temperate latitudes, when you come here to the tropics, they shift. And it depends on how flexible you are as far as how happy you will be with this. I mean, as an example, you know, potatoes and tomatoes, they get over 250 different diseases. The climate here, at least in Pune, will give those plants most of them. Uh, I have found growing potatoes here, at least in Pune, to be almost impossible and not worth the effort. Tomatoes, possible, with care. With the right varieties, you know, with the right fly traps, because you're going to have Chinese fruit flies putting maggots in the fruit. Uh, the big tomatoes are a very terrible, are a terrible choice here, you know. The, the beef steak you used to grow in Cincinnati, you know. Yeah, you could do it here. Frankly, from my point of view, it isn't even worth the effort. It really isn't worth the effort. Um, I grow tomatoes, mostly cherries and plums. They do the best here for me. Um, they're good. Uh, but then the rain, you know, causes disease problems, and so timing of when they're planted, how they're planted, where they're planted, the variety that's planted, and so on. Uh, I had the, the darndest issues with anything in the cucurbit family. Uh, squash, pumpkins, melons, you know, cucumbers, all that stuff. Almost impossible um, for me here on this one spot. Now, that's not actually true everywhere on the island. But uh, locally, I have so many pickle worms and so many melon worms here. It's a, they're two kinds of moths. They just destroy the crops. I mean, zucchini, which is easy in the mainland, it's a challenge here, man. The pickle worms are going to get into that thing. They're going to ruin the vine. They're going to ruin the stems. They're going to ruin the fruit. Uh, it's, it's pretty disgusting. I did not manage to pull off a successful, good squash crop here until I started using the locally adapted kabocha pumpkin seed. Uh, 
probably a calabaza, I think, um, the Caribbean squash, probably. I don't know. My guess is the Puerto Ricans originally brought it with them here. Uh, I don't know its history, but I know that it does work here, and I can get a good squash crop because it's resistant to those insects. So when you're working with the locally adapted varieties, you will find that you can find a tomato that grows, or there are certain peppers that thrive here. There are other peppers that don't do so well. It's a terrible place to grow a regular Yolo Wonder Bell, for instance. An awful place for it. Yeah, I get a few. A lousy location. On the other hand, the habanero pepper, the Hawaiian cocktail pepper, uh, some of the ahi chilies, you know, um, and so on. These all grow pretty well here. They'll live for years sometimes. So it's a matter of, you know, adapting to certain varieties, finding the right varieties, learning when to plant them, how to plant them, and so on. You know, it's a real problem raising hard corn here for grinding, you know, or for popping. Uh, because of drying the ears. Back in California or in the Midwest, once the corn got raped, we just let it hang on the stalk, usually, until it cured. Um, that was feasible. Here it rains too much, or the earworms will get in, and the rain will get into the holes, and then everything turns into mold, you know. And so timing the harvest with hard corn, so you're A, out of the earworm season, and B, in the driest period. So. Around here is usually somewhere in December through February. It tends to be some of the driest weather of the year we get. Having your corn ripening and drying on the stalk during that period makes it easier. So kind of figuring some of this out helps a lot. But, uh, you know, the, the reason I am here, one of the reasons at least, is the rain. I'm here for the rain. Um, I grew up in climates that rain quite a bit. Uh, I did not enjoy 25 years of irrigation in California to sustain the life of most of our plants. Um, I f firmly believe that uh, irrigation uh, is not green in general. Um, sometimes it can be, but in general irrigation isn't the best thing. Uh, if you have to, you got to. but. If you don't have to, it's better off that you live and grow in a place where the nature actually provides adequate moisture uh, to be able to grow most crops. That's my background. And so California was a challenge for me having to deal with drip irrigation and all that stuff. Um, here I don't worry about it. It's one of the reasons that I came here. There was naturally abundant water. And uh, now, of course, there's a lot of people that, of course, the tourists, they come here for the sunshine and the beaches. And so you wouldn't want to come to Puna if you were coming on vacation and you wanted to sit around in the sun. We get it. You can get a heck of a sunburn here, but you can never tell when that's going to happen because it's going to probably rain more often than it's going to be sunny. Um, and so if you're a sun worshiper, Puna ain't your place. There are a few spots that are drier and sunnier in Puna, like down by Kalapana, for instance. Uh, it's drier down there, half the rain or less. A lot more sunshine, but it's also lava zone one, okay, and so they get inundated with lava flows in that region, and it's not really the best place to want to set up and live, personally. Um, so, you know, if you come here, you've got to expect it to put up with a lot of rain. And so, it, rain is really good for raising ducks, it's really good for raising frit fish, awesome aquaculture area, you know, um, whether it's freshwater prawns or catfish or tilapia or whatever you're talking about. Um, the University of Hawaii here in Hilo has now become the number one school in the United States for aquaculture programs. I met one of the instructors, he's from Israel, and um, uh, he was pretty impressive. And the program they got going over there on freshwater aquaculture is extraordinary. Um, I have heard recently that the students are now setting up aquaculture in Hilo Bay for oysters. That excites me. I love my oysters. And so that, that is pretty neat and uh, I'd like to see what happens of it. So if you love aquaculture and you like fish, my goodness, this is a place. They raise commercial seahorses and here they, you know, the, the uh, netting and trapping of the aquarium fish it goes on here on the reefs. There's so much to do with water and fish. 
here in the islands, it's a great place if that's what you like. If you like to raise plants, nursery stock, you know, sometimes there's too much water for certain things here, but in general we have plenty of water to be able to grow most crops. Your problems are usually the opposite, trying to get the corn dry, you know. Uh, so it's easy that way, but it's not easy. There are plants that are well adapted. Coffee does well up here, down the mountain. Papayas do pretty darn well. Um, I do okay with avocado and a number of other local fruits. Citrus does pretty well here. Um, pineapple, crazy good. Pineapple grows really well. Um, so there are some things. Potatoes, mm-mm. <laughs> so, you know, if you want to grow carbs, you better like taro or sweet potatoes or uh, manioc, you know, the tapioca root, that kind of stuff. The tropical plants. They, so there are changes uh, that you may not be expecting that you'll undergo. Um, a good part of the island is completely off the grid. Um, you're lucky if you can get a cell signal in a lot of places around here. Um, there's a lot of places where there's no internet, no cable, no telephones, um, no water lines, definitely no sewer lines anywhere. Okay. Sewage across the island is pretty much uh, rural. Um, old places got cesspools, the new ones got uh, um, septic tanks. So, it's no garbage collection. <laughs> we have dumps, we have transfer stations, places you can go to haul the stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm used to hauling trash. We did it in the Midwest for years and years. So it doesn't phase me much. I kind of like not having a garbage bill every month, frankly. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of people who used to just throw the cans on the curb. Well, that don't happen here, all right? Um, it's a lot of things that you're probably used to that you don't have here. There are no freeways. There's a little bit of four-lane road, um, but it's not limited access coming in and out of Hilo and Kona. Other than that, the whole darn island is nothing but uh, two-lane blacktop on a good road or uh, two-lane gravel on a secondary road or uh, dirt, lava, mud on the rest of the island. Uh, you need a four-wheeler to get across some of this stuff. And so you know, there's very few signs. Finding anything here is difficult. Uh, Hilo has extraordinary shopping, frankly. It's the second largest town um, in Hawaii. And the services, I think, are pretty good for where we're sitting. But finding them is another story. I mean, it's the, so, so spread out, and it, it all looks like uh, steel building warehouse districts. I mean, it's some of the best Japanese restaurants on the island, or in what looks like a plumbing supply store. <laughs> it's not unusual. Figuring out where the stuff's at. Once you find it, that's yeah, great plumbing supply places, great electrical supply houses, great lumber dealers, and so on here. All kinds of stuff, but it's not the easiest thing to find. Yeah, which is the other thing, too, you know, about housing and, and you know, building design. And uh, I know before I moved here, uh, I am uh, um, a draftsman. I'm nothing I'm particularly proud of, but it is something I know how to do. And uh, I did uh, work in the Carpenters Union for over 15 years, and so I'm fairly capable at building and at building design. Uh, and so I started off by designing my own house with the intent of actually building my own uh, builder, owner, contractor. Um, over time, I hired a few other people to do some designs for me and so on. And in the long run, I am so glad, so glad that I didn't use my designs or the other folks' designs because they were all off-island. I eventually ended up with a, a Hansador package here from the lumber yard on this particular house that was it came with the, you know, the plans drawn. Pretty much everything except the concrete and, and putting it up. Uh, I'm so glad that that happened because the house was designed by Hawaiian designers, by people who had lived here 
and it works in this environment and the designs that I've been working with they were not going to be as cool here that's for sure because everything you thought you knew about life in the mainland and about building and about growing and so on by and large it don't apply here it's so many things are so different they really are that's, uh, and so you kind of go back through 101 when it comes to so much um, you know I, here we don't worry about heat all right um, wind of course could always be an issue but the wind speeds here are not really all that high either uh, we don't worry much about cold uh, because it really doesn't get that cold there either and so those are all issues that are very important on the mainland when you're building often here they aren't uh, they're kind of just secondary considerations by and large um, rainfall <laughs> here in Pune is the big one and if the building is designed so you're comfortable with rain this one here I'm able to flow completely around my living space go across the entire yard and from the shed to the house and so on without having to walk in the rain this house has huge eaves overhead and it has big lanai or porches that extend out and around it has great big covered carports and so forth and that sort of uh, living feature here is very 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 desirable because it rains a lot and if you're trapped inside the building because you can't walk outside without getting wet you get uncomfortable or if you like skylights for instance dumb idea don't put a skylight in the house here in Pona because it's a leak and the last thing you want in this environment is water getting inside the structure and so on there's just a whole lot of things about the way we build and design here that are different um, Airflow. Oh my God, airflow. Um, that's one of the problems with the sheep property. There's no airflow. You get down into some of these lots where you can buy, you know, three acres for $15,000 or that sort of thing. Um, they're down in the jungle. They're usually down where the air is from the trade winds is flowing over the tops of the trees. Getting air in there is difficult. And so when you have a lack of airflow, you're going to end up with accumulations of insects. You're also going to acquire mold. <laughs> mold grows in everything around here. Typical atmospheric humidity is well over 70%. Uh, it's typical. 80% humidity every day is not an unusual thing. Um, water gets into everything. Uh, most things tend to feel damp here when you pick them up, including your shirt in the closet. You know, I mean, you can get dehumidifiers and put them in the house, and that's a real good idea, actually, especially in certain strategic locations where you need things to be dry, because otherwise, after a while, everything starts to smell damp and moldy. Um, certain surfaces, like vinyls and leathers, oh, God, leather. <laughs> you know, if you love your leather jackets and stuff, don't bring them here. Not really. They just don't work out because mold just attaches right to them and grows. Vinyl, same way. Um, also where the skin oil, human skin oil gets onto things like a chair arm and stuff. It just, it'll grow mold. Um, you need to have excellent air circulation in your buildings. Um, and so the building should be designed to have airflow through, uh, is my suggestion. And that the placement of the house and the property, that it be open in such a way that the trade wind flow will come through that property. You know, like I say, you get one of these places down in the jungle, the air don't move through there, it goes over your head, and so you got mold everywhere, hand bugs, and you won't be happy. Uh, I guarantee you're not going to be happy with that. Um, even with the good airflow here and so on, um, and we have a, a lot of light that penetrates this building from the sun, and the light keeps things down too. The sun helps with it, the airflow helps with it, the materials that things are made out of, the sort of surfaces and so on. You know, and once you get it dialed in, it's not too bad. Um, but So, you know, paradise has its problems. There is no such thing, so that's a state of mind. Uh, you learn to live with any environment that you're in and whatever environment you end up in. Once you get there, you're there. And so you have brought with you just about everything with your reality and you're carrying it, you know. And so it doesn't really matter whether you place it down in the middle of Kansas, the middle of Ohio or Mexico or Hawaii, you know, things are going to be very similar because you're the one who's there.
And like I said, I don't want to hold myself personally responsible for watching this island become completely overpopulated just because people look at my video and say, hey, wow, Bill looks like he's having a good time. Well, I am, you know. It's true, but um, you may not. <laughs> you know, this ain't for everybody, man. Uh, my shoulders are all wet because I was out checking on the solar Christmas tree lights in my fruit trees to keep the rose beetles away this morning and man I couldn't get out there without it raining right now I'm under the eave of the roof shooting the video the rain has stopped and I could be out in the yard and I could feel the sun starting to come through now so Aloha hang loose